get started. Uh, so just a reminder, this meeting is being recorded. It'll be uploaded to YouTube uh, shortly after. And your participation in this meeting is an agreement to abide by the Open SSF Code of Conduct. Um, so uh, first off, uh, is there anybody sort of new to the meeting who wants to introduce themselves? All right. Okay. Um, so a couple of updates uh, before getting into that. Does anybody else have any sort of uh, interesting updates they wanted to bring up? So um, one of the the interesting ones. Um, was this so there is and i'll post it it's it's been posted in in slack as well um there is a samsung jenkins plugin for or sorry i should say samsung uh there is a salsa jenkins generator uh made by samsung um i believe the folks who are are making this based on um what they had sort of mentioned to me is that they, they are working out of Korea. So it is uh, a bit of a, like, um, it's a bit of a, a, a time shift there to, for, for them to kind of, uh, let's say attend these meetings, but it might be worthwhile to have them demo at some sort of more convenient time for them. Um, but uh, basically, I, you know, I, I took a quick look and I know that there's a few other folks who are working also on Jenkins plugins and, and Jenkins generators. So I want to get folks thoughts on this. Yeah, it's, it's 11 p.m. in Korea now. Yeah, so that's that's why I'm, I'm like, hey, if, if we, we talk to them about, you know, doing something, it might be worthwhile to have something that's a bit more convenient for them. My cursory sort of look at this was, um, hold on, sorry. Uh, my cursory sort of look at this was, it's it's fairly simple. It's fairly just sort of like looking at what happened in the Jenkins build and just sort of um, putting into Salsa. So I believe it's really only Salsa 1 at this point. And with maybe a little few other changes, it could be Salsa 2. Um, but still sort of, uh, I think one of the things that we kind of wanted to figure out is, is, Hey, when we kind of, um, pull this, these sorts of or additional things we can like the tooling team can sort of provide as sort of guidance on like, you know, implementation of a salsa generator, like what that sort of thing should look like. Um, and so on, so that, that folks understand, you know, like what the intent is of, you know, the ideal here is, is, you know, the builder should not be doing it. It should be the orchestrator of that build should be doing a lot of the stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Aaron. Yeah. Just, uh, I haven't looked at the, at this repo yet in depth. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we know that a lot of people use Jenkins still maybe, uh, maybe unfortunately, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Right. It, so uh, like you mentioned, they do say it's also level one provenance in their repo. Uh, yeah, I wonder, like by definition of, of Jenkins itself, right? I wonder if they would be able to design it to be, you know, creating the provenance in a service, uh, like a builder or service generated way, right? Because um, there's the way that Jenkins is. I don't know if they, I don't know. It's an interesting one, isn't it? Um, yeah. Yeah, it, it can probably be done at some level. And I know um, Eric uh, from uh, Wipro uh, has been, he had mentioned something that they've been working on some sort of plugin as well. The Intoto folks are also working on um, a Jenkins uh, plugin. And um, uh, so on that end, I mean, I do want to see if we can sync up some of those folks, uh, you know, not to say that there's, anything wrong with, especially at this level, having multiple Jenkins plugins because different 
things might be better for different use cases, but it's still probably worthwhile um, as we kind of go through. And I know it's one of the, the just for this group as kind of like a, a question for us is how much do we want to sort of help out in either hands-on keyboard or in at least um, providing sort of guidance around, you know, what a good salsa generator looks like like for example the salsa github generator that's you know internal that for us that like a lot of the the, the googler uh googlers have worked on and and whatnot yeah that makes sense yeah i'm just simply excited to see this um for jenkins it's pretty cool yeah it's interesting <clears throat> how much detail they pack in their environment section in the attestations. Yeah, I think I had the same observation. I think this attestation, they need to happen out of band, right? Like just like what chains or others are doing. It cannot be part of the uh, your build recipe in the pipeline because we are seeing developers who do not trust or the pipeline execution. Uh, while it is, it is happening, the provenance generation is not part of that. Uh, it is happening in the background. Yeah, cor correct. Um, and, uh, so in, that's why I think in this case, they, in the library, they say it's only salsa one. Cause I think salsa one, we, we allow that. Um, I don't remember exactly where, where, when we stop, uh, allowing that sort of thing and, and making it more part of the orchestration or sorry, the service needs to be the one that's actually recording it as opposed to the, the end user workload. Does anyone know what Jenkins is doing in this space? Like Jenkins team itself, the vendor. Uh, yeah. So yeah, yeah. There's a couple of things. Um, so that well, first off, there's a few folks who are working on plugins just across the space. Uh, as far as CloudBees itself, um, they seem to be a bit more, from my understanding at least, uh, and don't quote me on this, but but based on some conversations I've had and um, Parth might actually know, cause I know he's given a couple of demos is I believe they're kind of focused more on the Jenkins X side than the Jenkins core side, which Jenkins core being sort of the traditional Jenkins um, uh, legacy Jenkins. Parth? So last time, last time I spoke or oh, in the meeting for the CD foundation, they, they gave a presentation. So they were hoping they were, they were planning on getting to salsa level two by the end of the year. Um, integrating with the tecton chains um, and then past that point I think they didn't have anything else I think they were saying that they would start integrating uh, you know they were they have their own tecton catalog right because Jen Jenkins X um, underneath still uses tecton so they were updating their tecton catalog um, in, in basically making it more making it more um, easy for the you know for users to start using their pipelines and having those you know scans and everything else built into it uh, but at the same time, yeah, that their their plans was just, just to get this also two by the end of the year. And part of that's only with Jenkins X, not like the traditional core. Right. That's, it was just Jenkins X. Yeah, the Jenkins X team was was the only one that was on the call. So I, I'm not sure about the the core um, okay. for Jenkins X. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, with that with that said, the there's I know um Eric who's who's uh been on a lot of the um salsa calls. Uh he, I know he had mentioned that Wipro is working on a few things on this front as well. Um he also th there's I know a few other folks have been working on um kind of an abstraction on top of stuff like Jenkins, like in the CI C D system where the idea would be um, some other tool would take care of looking at what Jenkins is, let's say, doing and doing like so. So Jenkins itself would even the orchestration piece uh, would be just considered an end user workload. 
and there would be something else calling out to that Jenkins um, to make it do things. And then it would, you know, it would do the recording and, and, and whatever. There's some stuff on that end, like that's coming out of, for example, Red Hat, uh, one thing called, um, I'm blanking on the name of it, uh, but it's made by Bill Bensing uh, over there. Um, Ploygos, was that right? Ploygos, yeah. That is uh, maybe a kind of a one pipeline, like opinionated implementation of pipelines, right? Like this is a strict way. Uh, set of controls which are embedded into it and you just take it and run it. Uh, uh, input is Git repository, output is your build artifact. You don't care about what is in between. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so yes, they, they're focused more on the, they, they're calling it like governance aspect or the governance abstraction sort of aspect. Um, there's also uh, just, just as an FYI, cause I think it's kind of related to what we're looking to do. Um, the CD foundation has been pushing this sort of thing as well, which is um, what they're calling like intent based pipelines. Um, the other things that are kind of coming out of the CD foundation, which are just things we should probably be cognizant of is they're, they're pushing, um, for what they're calling also, uh, cloud, uh, sorry, CD events, which is a, a sort of a very, a, a bit of more of a specific version of cloud events. So the idea would be, um, potentially right. Like everything becomes event driven. And I think that's something that we need to. Uh, that we need to just sort of think through um, if CD events becomes a bit more uh, widely adopted. I think that's going to kind of potentially complicate things because uh, cloud events, everything then becomes more of like an event-driven architecture and all asynchronous. And what would that look like from the perspective of something trying to generate salsa provenance? Um, just something to, to keep in mind. I don't think it's, we have to go over it right this second. Okay. Um, so what else? Um, from the last couple of meetings, the what we've been focused on for folks who, who uh, haven't been able to attend as much, the main things that we've been focused on are twofold. One is around integrations for attestation distribution and discovery. Um, and so this is, uh, where is this thing? Let me just, it's in the notes already, but I will post it again here. And I posted the notes again and, oh, hold on. I also posted in this chat. All right. And I will also share my screen here. So we've been still mostly focused on the attribution, uh, sorry, attestation, distribution, and discovery. Uh, so as a reminder from a few weeks ago, we had some of the folks from OCI come in, um, Mike Brown in particular, uh, who talked through some of the big changes that had just been merged in um, uh, or stuff like um, the image and distrib uh, the image and uh, distribution specs, which allow us to be a bit more flexible with how we use um, uh, salsa attestations. Uh, then also we were we've been talking a little bit about because um, I know we have Frederick on as well about sort of the plans for or at least the proposals for how npm might distribute uh, store and distribute uh, salsa attestations. Um, there was some also some discussion here in the chat. Uh, sorry, in the document, um, some comments about how Maven might be doing the same sort of thing for Java. Uh, then also, um, you know, we briefly have been kind of talking about what uh, attestation discovery might look like, uh, you know, from the perspective of, hey, what happens if somebody wants to run a query against just the environment at large? What might that look like? Um, but we sort of said, hey, let's push that off a little bit until we have a better understanding of what the distribution might look like um, across the board. Uh, with that said, one of the things that keeps coming up is there's a lot of confusion around um, ReCore, um, because uh, if you read the README for ReCore, um, it, it, it sort of is pretty clear that 
one of the one of its intentions is to be an API for distribution and discovery of attestations. Um, but pretty much everybody who works on Recore is saying that's actually really not the case. Um, so I think we just need to make sure that uh, we update the documentation so that it's very clear that for you know for some definition of of um, you know. Uh, distribution, it, that's true, but it should not be, you know, one of the big things that's been discussed is, is uh, recourse should not be used as the primary distribution method of those attestations. And so just um, that's something that I think, and I was actually uh, before this call writing up a an issue for the recourse folks to try and maybe make that a, a, a little clearer. Um, the other thing that we were also talking about, which is also a big one, is um, maybe defining some sort of pattern for out of band file distribution, like, uh, sorry, attestation file distribution. So this is stuff like JSON lines, right? So in Toto, push, um, in Toto uh, recommends using JSON lines as the way that you, if you were to distribute this as flat files. Um, uh, or rather, if, if you distribute this as just as files, you should be distributing it as JSON lines files, and those uh, salsa attestations as as uh, as um, as JSON lines files. But the thing I think that has come up a few times is what does that like? How do folks um, distribute it? Like, how do folks distribute it, discover it, fetch it, pull it down, and so on? Like, is there a pattern for doing that so that as people build tools, we can point everybody to you know? Everybody can implement it any way they want, but like generally, this is what it sh probably should look like. Um, Sean? Yeah, I, I just had kind of one point of clarification around the JSON lines, especially when it comes to attestation bundles, because that would seem to be the primary use case for having JSON lines rather than just a flat JSON file. Um, are we just expected to be able to create bundles by concatenating together? Um, Existing existing attribute um, attestations which are already DSSE um, enveloped, or do we need to kind of stack them in, in in their in their raw form and then DSSE the entire bundle? That's a good question, Mark. Do you, I know we've had a couple of conversations about this? Do you know a bit more about the intention there? I, I, I think the intention is just that you could concatenate them with new lines in between, right. um, which is why JSON lines was suggested because it's like easy to do. You just right. have so a JSON ending in a new line and pipe it to a file. So yeah, basically and your your file format is then um, one JSON line per DSSE wrapped attestation. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, and and they're all independent, and then the consumer would be expected to just ignore any ones that they don't care about or recognize. Right, so as long as there isn't a separate envelope format for bundles, then that will work for me. Yeah, yeah, that's, um, I have that kind of concern is that if we have any envelope format that's not JSON, then that bundle format doesn't work very well. Um, but I think that from what I've heard from most people is that the, that they're less worried about that and they more like the benefit of having it be a super simple file format. And you just cat it, you don't have to have like any special library to parse it or anything like that. Yeah, that makes, <laughs> makes things a lot simpler. Yeah, um, so if, do folks um, actually, so as we kind of go through this, um, let me kind of go through, do, does anybody have any update on some of the OCI stuff? Uh, and I don't want to put anybody on the spot here, but like, I know it, the, the stuff has been merged, but I don't know what the timeline is for actually releasing it. I, I know you're picking on me when you say you don't want to say. Yeah. Anybody, so. Yeah. I wasn't going <laughs> to. <laughs> yeah. Um, we've got the release candidates currently preparing to get tagged over there. And so that is in the works getting voted on. Um, they've got the PRs ready to go. So that's just waiting on a few people to vote and then we'll at least have something out there to look at. There are a few more uh, pieces to clean up as we go, but it's at least a state people can try it out.
cool. Um, now to, I guess, pick on uh, Frederick or somebody uh, from who's been doing some of the stuff on the Node JavaScript NPM side. Um, uh, do you know what the status is of that um, RFC and has there been any decisions on um, how this stuff will get, I, I know there was a couple of different options that you were considering. Yeah, so uh, the RFC is still open. I think we are waiting for one more um, NPM CLI meeting. I think there is like happening every week. So if I'm not mis mistaken, I think we should expect to sort of merge the PR with RFC next week or the week after that. Uh, for distribution, uh, it's still sort of as we were discussing before. So the primary way uh, the NPM client will or the NPM CLI will get the attestations is by uh, retrieving them from the package, package registry. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, Mark, you have your hand up. Yeah, I have actually a question going back to the OCI um, thing. Um, one, uh, just to, just to make sure I understand the proposal correctly, the idea is that you would store an attestation, um, like you'd store the attestation itself as a blob, you'd store a manifest, I guess, that like contains the blob as a layer, or I'm not sure I'm using the right terminology, and refers to the subject. Yeah, so and the, then that would effectively that, index by the subject. The thing that changed here that we had going before is you can always go out and Helm charts do it today, a bunch of other tools do it today, where you can push your external artifact to a container registry as long as you follow a certain format and as long as the registry is not blocking certain things. So there are a few, few small gotchas in there, but effectively you can already push a blob out there. You can uh, list that in your manifest. You can push all that up to a registry and then you can look at the registry, see your tag and pull that down. Um, so that's how, you're, how they're doing Helm charts today. What we added in this with the new feature is be able to say, let's be able to associate that with an existing image. And so I can query an image and say, now from this image, tell me all the other artifacts that point to this, like the signatures, like the S-bombs that are affiliated with this image. And so it gives you a query interface to look all those up without having to know what the tag is of that artifact that's going to be different from the tag of the image. Right, right. Um, and... and um... You could, I think in the, in the proposal, you could query by type. Is that right? Yeah. So what's going to get returned is today you've got the concept of a manifest list for a multi-platform image manifest. So you'll have a whole bunch of individual uh, pointers to those descriptors for each individual platform specific manifest. We're using almost an identical data structure. It is an identical data structure for the artifacts themselves, where they're also in a list and they have the individual descriptors to each artifact that you have in that list. And you can also put annotations in there. And so you can say there are the various little, um, the annotations for whatever kinds of metadata you need on your object. So you know which one from that list you wanna pull. And so you can say, this is the SBOM in a JSON format. This is the signature coming from cosine, all the different kinds of metadata you need to pick and choose out of there. Maybe you're gonna have an extra piece of metadata that says who the signer is, whether it's, Cyclone DX or SPDX, that kind of stuff, that can all be put in annotations. So you, when you're looking through that list of artifacts, you can figure out which one you want to pull. And yeah, Aaron, right. So I'll... like the the go ahead. That that J. So like the S bomb, let's say, is uploaded as one blob, and then you upload a. Is it a manifest? Is that the type that then? Yeah. Everything to a registry, the there's there's a manifest to it. So the blob is just raw data. And so there's a manifest mm -hmm. that captures that. And that's the combination of the manifest and your blob is your artifact. And mm -hmm. then we're going to capture that association between that thing and your other images out there. Yeah. And, and that manifest contains the refers to the original artifact. That's yeah. It, yeah. It has a little bit of extra data in there. And then the whole spec defines how we work with existing registries, new registries, how that works, all the different API calls needs to happen. Um, in the proposal, uh, I think there's a, 
um, an option that when you query the API, uh, the endpoint for referrals, you could either just do it given an artifact or do it including a type. Is that right? Yeah, there's the like an optional filter. Type. Yeah, they, they're adding a filter type in there for the media type of the artifact. And so they're, it's called an artifact type, but it's like an IANA media type out there. And so you can query on that one, but that's one of a handful of things you could potentially query on when you get back the full list of everything. You can always query on all the different annotations in there as well. So the filter on there just trims down what that list of everything is. So you just get the certain types of artifacts. So if you want just the signatures, but I suspect a lot of people are going to want to get finer grain than that that says, not only do I want to know the signature, but I want the signature signed by these people that I know. And so when you get I that see. list as a client, you can filter through that. I see. So like, you're not expecting that to be like the be all end all of filtering that like most clients will just pull them all back and then filter client side. Yeah. Yeah. And in the, in the initial stuff, what we're going to see from registries is that's the only option. They're going to pull everything back and then query it all, filter it all in client side. The future when registries upgrade, they'll be able to at least do that initial set of filtering on the server side that says, just give me the stuff for my media types. Yeah, uh, the, the reason, and, and this is the media type of the SBOM or whatever? It's the artifact type is the field name is what they're using. And so that is the media type of the config blob if you're using the image manifest or if you use the new artifact manifest, it's called artifact type in there. But it's, it's an IANA media type. And so we're assuming that whoever's using that, hopefully they go out and register their name I, I held off on saying they must register a name because even OCI isn't good about registering all of our names. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, sorry, now I'm trying to find it in the proposal. Uh, is this in the image spec or in the distribution spec? So image spec defines how we modify the manifest with the extra fields and distribution spec defines how you query those. I see, so it'll be in the distribution spec. Um, the, the, the reason I ask this is in this forum. Yeah, okay, so refers, um, here, let me just present here. Uh, actually, no, it, it's already presented, Michael. Do you want to open up the, um, here, I could just actually link directly to the line. And I do have to jump to another meeting here in a second. Okay, um, the, where's the, yeah. Uh, well, and while you're getting the, there, oh, sorry. Refers the reference and the artifact type equals artifact type. Um, I guess I'm wondering, in our case, all the artifact types will always just be like in toto. Um, mm -hmm. And I was wondering, would it make sense to define like a, a because you media types have like an optional parameters, like a semicolon, then you could have parameters. Um, we could define parameters that kind of say like point one layer in so that way you could filter by the predicate type you know like the next layer down uh i, was I would wondering lead to annotations for that and so i would put that kind of extra data in the annotation and then when you get the full descriptor list back you'll have those annotation lists to look through and figure out which item from the list you want to get okay rather than using media type for that yeah yeah i see uh okay, yeah the, the media type is going to say instead of you trying to get two fine grain in there, it's more just saying my tool knows how to work with Intoto. So only give me the Intoto stuff and not all the the other things that are, people are going to be pushing annotations for or artifacts. Okay, thanks. Cool. And Aaron, I saw your comment. I'll drop a link over in the, um, in the meeting notes here in a minute, but I got to jump. Take care, everybody. Later. All right. Yeah, that the OCI stuff sounds interesting. I need to uh, dive in a bit more there. Um, I think the other thing, um, does anybody else have any other questions, comments on that, that somebody else maybe who was on the call can, can answer? Um, so the... The other thing that I know is is stuff that we've been discussing, and I know that there is a if I 
bring this if I bring up the GitHub, uh, the the PR for salsa here. Oh yeah, so on the the Oris end, if anybody knows anybody who who works on the Oris side, who uh, they can maybe join one of these meetings or otherwise we can maybe coordinate with them. I think that would also be um, really valuable. Some folks have been commenting out of band about you know getting folks from the Oris side to um like to us to have a conversation but it's it's been hard to coordinate there's also um okay so give me one second to also share this So one of the things that um, Seth uh, had, oh, did I not? Uh, I guess that I thought I added a comment here. Um, so uh, there's some discussion about, you know, um, writing up a few things to to make it clearer what we're trying to do from, oh, sorry, what reasonable patterns look like for distributing um, JSON lines files, storing them, et cetera, like what sorts of things could people do um, when implementing tools, right? So one of the things that was brought up, I think in a previous meeting, I don't remember who had brought it up, was, hey, it's great that, um, you know, NPM, OCI, uh, all these other Python, all these, sorry, Python packages, et cetera, like all these packages are starting to look at um, integrating uh, salsa, uh, salsa provenance, but what happens when um, either the release happens out of band, like, hey, this is just a tarball and um, we store it on GitHub, like what should the general flow look like so that um, as people build out additional tools, one is they don't have to reinvent the wheel and maybe that there is a couple of common patterns for this sort of out of band distribution mechanism. Right, where it's like, hey, it's not, you know, it's it's something like a tarball, it's not, or it's something like, hey, this I am distributing some sort of package, but the package itself, there's no um, there's no standard around including stuff like attestations in the package in some way. Uh, so one of the things that was kind of discussed was, you know, uh, taking these in toto um, JSON lines bundles and sort of describing at least some sort of pattern for how it is normally stored. Like, is it just purely something like you have the package, you have a JSON lines file, and you have some way of naming that JSON lines file so that you know that it refers to that package you're downloading, something like that. I wanted to get folks' thoughts on that. I'm sorry, I didn't quite follow under, follow what you meant. Could you repeat it? Sure. Um, and I'm sorry, it seems like every single time my I share my screen, <laughs> it my everything starts to glitch out on my PC. So I'm just gonna stop sharing for a second. Um, I'll have to figure out why that is. Uh, but um, so the 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 main thing, right, was uh, we have like today, if you want to um, share. Uh, a, a salsa attestation. The way we've been recommending is, you know, you you do it via JSON lines because that's what Intoto supports and yada yada. But the thing, right, is is, you know, the JSON lines file. Like, should it be the same? Like, it, should it be something like, you know, foo .tar .gz .json l? Should it be the hash of the file? Should you know how should these things be stored? Like, in some cases, some folks have said hey, I want to store all the attestations for the stuff I'm building on a separate endpoint. So I have a REST endpoint. Somebody can just sort of say, hey, I'm about to pull down this package, query the attestation. Some people are saying, no, no, no. Uh, I'm assuming that every endpoint, let's say, you know, is going to be this package slash version number. And then there's the actual tarball. And then right next to the tarball is a JSON lines file with the attestations. I don't know, um, you know, if folks have given thought to those patterns, but that's kind of 
the the big question is people are asking like, hey, for things that are not integrated directly into package managers today, could I write a shell script? Could I write a simple tool that if folks just start distributing it in this way, cool, I can pull down you know a, a Python package, not be a pip, but I can pull down a Python package. I could easily know because there's a common pattern for this. I know that the if there is an associated salsa attestation, it's going to be here. Is there some sort of pattern that we can at least push out there and maybe then also write some tools tooling for so that folks can get started without needing that like deep integration in every single tool, whether it's you know Ruby gems, you know pip, et cetera. Well, I can comment on the way that that we're currently planning to do it. Um, so for every um, package that we generate a, a binary for, um, that artifact has a, a unique ID, which is the um, which is a Merkle tree, Merkle hash, um, leading up to the to the actual artifact based on all the all the dependencies. And so what we're doing is, although we're storing our attestations apart from the artifacts, um, we're presenting an API whereby. Uh, if you ask for the artifact by its ID, you can also ask for the attestation by its ID as well. And they're just the same, they, the, the same path uh, in HTTPS. You get the same path and you get the artifact tarball or you get the wheel or the gem or whatever it is that we're actually serving up as the artifact. And then the same URL with um, attestation.intoto.jsonl gets you the attestation for that artifact. In actual fact, because we're now using multiple steps in our build pipeline, that will probably be just called multiple dot um, in toto dot JSONL because that's the recommendation for bundles. Cool. Yeah, that that definitely makes sense um, uh, to me at least. Uh, does anybody else have any thoughts on you know doing it sort of content addressably via the Merkle hash? or some sort of um, hash? Yeah, I don't, I don't have any comment on the Merkle hash, but I could definitely see you know value in having that unique identifier, of course, right, for that thing, not even just a 1.2, like V1.2, but actually having like something that's, like a little bit more, I guess it wouldn't be immutable, but like a little bit more specific, right? Well, yeah, I mean, it, I mean, in the case of what Sean described, uh, it would be definitely, uh, uh, it should be immutable there. Um, uh, and and the thing there that I think is, it's one of the things that I, I know um, is something we've been playing around with a little bit is, uh, you know, if you build the dependencies, those things can have um, various uh, JSON lines. Uh, th those can have all attestations and then whatever the resultant package is because you have the full sort of Merkle hash. I I'd be curious actually to better understand like, cause, cause you can do um, from my understanding, right? Using the Merkle hash, you can do the inclusion proof easily but it's hard to do the reverse lookup, right? Yeah. It's yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, but basically what we do, so the idea is that um, we're not quite there yet, but what you should be able to do is regenerate the Merkle hash from the material section that's listed in the, um. the JSON file, because basically it's all the inputs that went in there that are factored into the Merkle hash are actually there in the attestation as well. So you should be able to reverse engineer it that way, but you can't necessarily just take a Merkle hash and work out what the dependencies were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but, but because we list the um, the URIs to the um, to the artifacts for the dependencies, you can then walk the graph back by uh, going back to those and then asking for the in toto at the same endpoint for those artifacts as well. So you can basically walk the walk the graph of attestations back to the root as well. Yeah. Um, Mark, uh, uh, it looks like you to to Sebastian's comment of like having a gap in the recommendations. I think the, at least the way I've been thinking about this would be that we have a 
recommendation for like, I, I do think it makes sense to do ecosystem by ecosystem. Like if, um, like, I don't know what NPM is planning on doing, um, but, or, or actually, I don't even to be honest, know how you even fetch packages from NPM. I don't even know what the protocol is. Um, but I would imagine in cases where you fetch it by some sort of file name, um, that it makes sense to have a concrete recommend. Actually, we do have a concrete recommendation, uh, which is that you append a dot in toto dot JSONL suffix. Um, that way, all these different ecosystems, if they are doing it by file name or it's like on the file system or something like that, then we can um, using the same suffix. I think, or convention, or whatever the convention is, uh, I think makes it easier because, like, they all do it. If there's cases where, like, oh, you use this one endpoint to to get this thing and a different endpoint to get something else, then then that's okay. But I think, in particular, this case was about file name based ones. Is that right, Michael? Yeah, and and it was about sort of like completely, uh, like, yeah, I I I almost feel like we we should be having a a bit of a a hierarchy of like. Yeah, if it can be integrated directly into the um, the the what you call it the um, into the package manager itself or the distribution mechanism of that package itself, then absolutely it should. But like I know a lot of folks are saying, "Hey, great! It's gonna take you know based on just as an example, like, hey, like uh, there's there's like for example the npm stuff." They have an RFC. They're going to be doing that. It's going to take some time to actually implement everything, get it all sort of followed through with. But some folks might say, "Great, well, I'm I'm distributing packages with with salsa attestations already. How should I do that?" Right? And some people might say, "Okay, well, great. Here's here's maybe a, a way we can at least get you started until the more official way is actually implemented." And then in certain cases as well, some of the stuff that's actually come up is like what happens in cases where there is no distribution mechanism, right? Like certain things like where, uh, like there are certain types of things where the output is essentially just a tarball. And so there's, and it's not really like, you know, it's, it, there's no sort of pip install, NPM install for whatever that thing is. And so everybody just sort of downloads that tarball and unpacks it. Like, is there a way to, um, still, you know, distribute uh, salsa attestations such that like there's at least a common pattern that if folks know, oh yeah, here's here's something that's out of band, you know, it's not like inside of a package manager or whatever. I can just pull it down, uh, pull down, and 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 I know I could go and look at like as like Sean described, like if if uh, if the the artifact is listed by a hash or something like that. Then I can pull hash dot you know whatever uh, dot JSON lines. The other thing I think that's kind of been you know, and I think that thing is 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 important from I think the also the um, using the JSON lines as the bundle because and if like multiple attestations potentially there right because otherwise how can you easily have everything refer to that package um, without some sort of mechanism of saying you know there needs to be I, I think a uh, some mapping between the attestations to the artifacts, especially if there's multiple artifacts in the same sort of directory or whatever. Uh, th that's really, I think, kind of where we're trying to kind of figure out. Because I think somebody from the, I believe it was from the S bomb side, had had brought up that you know lots of folks are distributing packages in ways that are not like using a package manager. And so they're just files. And so a lot of folks are just asking for, you know, hey, when you just, you know, when you distribute me this tarball, I also expect an attestation and I expect an easy way to know that that attestation is supposed to be pointing at that file. That's it. Yeah, I think the worst, worst offenders here are the um, packages that install themselves with a shit pipe or curl pipe shit. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 exactly. And and that's like the thing of, you know, um, something we've been playing around with a little bit is, hey, um, you are even significantly better if you had a 
let's say a very basic tool that does the curl pipe, you know, shell, but when it curls, it also verifies that it has a salsa attestation that, you know, from a signature you trust before piping into SH, right? Like um, even having a tool that just does that, you're, you know, it's much better than a lot of what the other things we're seeing. <laughs> Mark, uh, you mentioned that we do have a recommendation for like the file. So I think what you said was the the salsa provenance attest attestation file. Do we have that recommendation for the dot and toto dot JSON L. Is that on the salsa website or? Yeah, I think I think one problem is like all these things are spread across all these different repos, um, so it's hard to find, and probably would be good to have some sort of condensed documentation of like, here's the suite of things that are recommended. You don't have to use all of them and the layers can be swapped out. Um, mm -hmm. It is... Uh, I'm, pure, I'm purely curious. I'm not trying to, yeah. to call you out. No, no, no. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sending it right here because I think it's very easy to miss. Um, I'm trying to update the list. Convention for naming bundle files. Uh, I'll add it to the meeting notes as well. Great. Um, actually, I should I should link to specifically to the file naming convention. Uh, yeah, uh, but it's like super easy to miss. I see it now. This is good. Thank you. Yep. Um, I have a question about the naming convention there as well. Um, so we're um, producing pipelines that actually produce our artifacts. So there are multiple steps between source repo and binary artifact. And so what we're doing is we're generating artifacts, intermediate artifacts along the way that we feed in through the pipeline. Um, so there, you know, we've got one piece of source code, multiple steps and, and a final output. Should we be naming our attestations there? They're going to be bundles. Um, because they will have an attestation for each of the intermediate artifacts as well. Um, should we be naming that for the final artifact or should we, because we've got multiple artifacts in that chain, be calling it multiple.intoto.jsonl? That, that's a good question. And I think we should clarify that in the docs. Um, if you read the docs directly, I think it should be called multiple because there's different subjects. Um, but if, if I understand correctly, I think in practice, people don't care about the intermediate artifacts and they really just care about the end artifact. And it is really a bundle about the end artifact along with supplemental attestations that you would like kind of want to chain together. And so that would imply that you really ought to be naming it by the, the artifact file name. And so yeah. here, I think, um, I think you're agreeing with me um, or maybe I'm agreeing with you, I don't know which. Uh, that probably makes sense to be called, like, it's not really about what the subjects are, but really about what you're trying to verify and like what the consumer is trying to verify. And so like, if there's a natural name that people are trying to verify, then you just append the suffix to have all of the necessary attestations to verify that thing. If it's a bundle of like kind of independent things and there's no natural name, then then we could suggest a default name. Is that is that what you're thinking is? Yeah, that that, that that's that kind of in line with what I'm thinking here. Okay. It just seemed it just uh, seemed a bit odd that pretty much every one of our artifacts would just have multiple in photo.jsonl. Yeah, let me uh, I'll, I'll file an issue real quick right now and then we could fix it. It's easier to file the issue than to actually yeah. change the docs. If I can just mention, as we talked a bunch of this, like we are, I think, straying away a little bit in the NPM use case from what has been discussed so far. So as an example, uh, we will primarily be fetching the attestation via package name and version. 
and also when the register returned at the stations, we will not return uh, the raw DC envelope as a JSON line format. We will return them in the new six store bundle format that's being proposed as we speak right now. So it's not really done yet, but we're working on getting that uh, bundle format standardized. And, and the reason for that is that we are signing everything with Fosio and publishing uh, data station on recourse. We would like to have a consistent way of delivering not just the attestation, but also the, the key material to the client so they can verify that as well. So that's why we are taking a little bit of a different approach. Yeah, I think I think the key material is really important. Sorry to jump in front, Mark. Um, I think the key material is really important, right, to think about distributing it because you know if I'm not using Fullcio and just want to give someone my public key, right, to verify, like that's another scenario, right, that I think is yeah. important. We distribute that, signature right? Signature block, the signature block in the attestation. You can put you can put the signature, but you can also put the certificate for that signature in as well. So you've got the public key in there. So you can, oh, okay. you've got pretty much everything in that block in order to verify oh, within the attestation it. itself. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's excellent then. Never mind. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, just not wrote, that I just wrote a whole bunch of Python to go to do certificate chain yeah. validation. But is uh, not that it's actually bothering me, but it's because I, I do think there was an issue on the DC envelope to actually have certificate as an attribute in the signature field. I'm not sure if that's sort of accepted and standardized yet. But I'm, I do know a lot of folks are putting the certificate in the DC envelope. Okay. But uh, there is another thing for us that we are very picky about as well, and that's having assigned the timestamp. And for us, we're getting that from Recor. So having that entire, let's say, Recor blob uh, be stuck into the DC envelope at 12 fields, like maybe doing a little bit too much violence on, on the specification. So, so for that, we are uh, sort of sending the, the recore response or the recore entry parallel to the data station. So they can also verify that the signature actually happened, sorry, the signing ha happened during the validity of the certificate. Uh, could I ask that someone uh, update the notes to proper capture that? Because I don't think I followed all those points. Um, about like the the difference between the JSON L format. Uh, like if you, if you could like link to the SIG store bundle format, I'm actually having difficulty finding what that format is. Um, and uh, like what's missing, I think that'd be helpful to record in the notes. Sure. Um, I add the pull request to the notes. Uh, there we go. So do you want me to sort of give a quick overview again? You're muted. Sorry, uh, thanks. Um, you said something about including the timestamp or the and the certificate or something like that? Yes. That... Uh, so yeah, to sort of go back a little bit, we are using Olsio to sign the attestations. And because of that, we are getting a ephemeral certificate, or we're actually creating it ourselves and then sending it for full suit to be signed by full suit. Uh, and that certificate is like short lived 15 minutes, I think the default expiration is. So to make sure that the client can verify that we actually use this certificate during the time it was valid, we are also sending. Uh, that the station to record, and as part of that, record is sort of timestamping that signing the entire thing with record public key and returning back a response, which can be used for offline verification. So that response is something we would also like to send to the NPM CLI, so NPM can CLI can actually verify not just the signature, but also that it happened during the time the certificate was valid. That's interesting. Um... It's, it's almost like if you wanted to do it independently, you'd need something like um, the way Authentico does it, 
and embedding the timestamp in the signature. That is not super trustful, I think, because you don't have a third party observer of the timestamp. Um, well, with, with Authenticode you do, because you have to go and get a signed timestamp from a, uh, an external time server. Yeah. You can't, and, and, you can't and, and that's what we're using Recore for. Right. Uh, the Sixer bundle proposal also allows for regular RFC 3161 timestamps as well. So it doesn't have to be right. Recore. Recore is just one of the options. And I do I think, think I'm not, oh, sorry, go ahead. Would it makes, would it make sense? So the bundle, the term bundle here is actually used differently than in Toto. Um, because the, in, in Toto, one envelope is like a assigned message with like some metadata. And here the bundle is still one message and it's just wrapping the envelope with some additional stuff that doesn't have a field in it. I wonder if we should just extend DISI to have these fields. Yeah, and, and speaking of bundle, if you have a better name, we're very open for that because bundle is extremely overloaded. It's used differently in very different places. Um, we kind of stuck with bundle right now because in actually it's a pretty good word, but it's overloaded. So it's very sort of ambiguous of what it means. But in, in the Sixer community, bundle is used quite a bit to kind of capture this um, usage of it. But there is another thing here as well, which is that uh, the Sixer proposal can also use let's say a naked signature and a payload hash as well, because if I understood correctly from the Maven use case, they won't actually uh, put the DC envelope in this. They, they will put the DC envelope into the Maven package and sign the Maven package as an opaque blob and capture that in this bundle format. That's the understanding I have. Uh, I'm not sure if that's true anymore, but that, sort of takes a little bit of a different uh, sort of take this in a little bit of a different direction. And, and also one of the original, let's say drivers from this came from the fact that in six store, if you are signing a blob, you don't get, let's say a single artifact that contains signature, payload hash, et cetera, together. Whereas if you sign a container, you kind of get a similar OCI manifest that was discussed earlier on this call, like that contains actually everything and the digest and the certificate and the possible recur entry, et cetera. So even in SIG store, there is a little bit of disconnect between how the different outputs are depending on what you're signing. So, so this is also one of the things that the SIG store bundle is trying to fix, or at least give the opportunity to have a more consistent way of capturing output of the signature process. Nice. That was interesting. Thank you for sharing. And okay. oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, like uh, the six door bundle thing. It's a regular pull request. So if anyone have feedback, we're we're happy to take it on. Oops. Oh, so it hasn't been merged yet. Correct. We are still debating. <laughs> I see. Yeah, my, my, without knowing all the implications, like my first reaction would be that it seems like it would be desirable to move it into the DISI spec so that like, uh, it seems like SIGSTOR shouldn't have to define that format, ideally. Um, and if we had it, you know, again, kind of move it to, to the larger standard. Um, yeah. There was discussion in the DISI repo about having like the timestamp field and a certificate field, et cetera. Um, and I think just it never was added just because no one has done it. Um, I, I don't know if enough of the implications if 
if it would solve, re basically remove the need. It sounds like you still want to have some wrapper to allow different types of envelopes. Yeah, or let's say a naked signature over a blob where we don't really know yeah. what we're signing. But yeah. at, at least for me personally, I don't think it's, let's say, important if it's, let's say, defined or if, if, if the specification lives in Sigstore versus this, because even in Sigstore, we have a lot of support, or we in Sigstore have a lot of support for, for this envelope. And so, so I don't think it's crucial in that sense. I think it's more crucial that we get some alignment between the different ecosystems here. I know we're already actually a couple of minutes over here, so I don't want to take up um, any more of anybody's time. But uh, yeah, I think this is good discussion. Um, it sounds like there's a couple of things maybe to follow up in the Slack on the Salsa tooling Slack out of band um, that we can kind of yeah talk through. Because I I do think the the main thing is we want to just make sure that we're we're being relatively consistent, even if there's like two or three different options. We just want to make sure that there's not like everybody comes up with their own option and, and then none of the tools can interop. <laughs> That's really the, the takeaway. Cool. Well, I'll see uh, if, if I don't uh, talk to you, I'll see you all next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.